Hello, welcome to another Tweedy Pubs video in the area of Wapping and going to be heading on into Limehouse later for today's video. Pub number one, the town of Ramsgate. It's a listed building and historic England say it's 18th century but built on older foundations. Later alterations in the 1930s by Hall and Co Brewery and that's probably where the ground floor frontage dates from. It has dark red tiles to the dado height and cream coloured pillars between the windows. Looking at the upper floors, I think they look a bit more Neo-Georgian than Georgian, suggesting those alterations in the 1930s may have been closer to a partial rebuild. Compare it to its neighbour, and that does appear to retain an original Georgian frontage. We also have this drawing which appeared in the Art Journal in an article on Riverside Inns in 1890. You can see, for example, a brick arch above the window on the second floor. That's not there today. Quite a lot of the frontage faces onto the narrow alleyway to the side, whopping old stairs, and that leads down to the river here. On the inside, this is on camera's list of historic pub interiors. The bar counter dates back to that 1930s remodeling, and it features some subtle Art Deco styling, particularly these simple but elegant geometric capitals. Some of the bar back is more modern, but one section does seem to be in a style consistent with the bar counter. Again, you can see these similar capitals and there's some leaded glazing to the side there. Two short stubs of partitions remain with more leaded and partly coloured glazing. This etched mirror towards the front of the pub is also mentioned in camera's listing bearing the words Ramsgate Harbour. There's also a very nice terrace at the back of the pub. It overlooks the river and the famous whopping stairs. So let's take a look at the pub's history. There is a timeline on the pub's website and it lays claim to having been here since 1545. Very hard to find records going back that far, but you can at least see whopping stairs clearly marked on William Morgan's 1682 map. So we know this area would have been developed at that time. Just a few years after that map was created, the pub was reputedly where Judge Jeffreys was apprehended in 1688. He was a judge during the reign of James II and he became unpopular for his perceived bias towards the king when passing judgments, particularly for his role in the Bloody Assizes, where he presided over court cases which saw hundreds sentenced to death for treason for their role in the Monmouth Rebellion. With the overthrowing of James II and the arrival of William III, Jeffreys decided it was best to make himself scarce and, so the story goes, he was hiding out in Wapping while trying to find a ship to get him out of the country but was recognised and was sent to the tower where he died the following year. I couldn't find any contemporary written records identifying this pub as the place he was apprehended. The London Gazette in 1688 simply states that he was taken at Wapping. A 1689 biography of Jeffreys contains a letter wherein he was described as being taken at Rope and Anchor Alley in Wapping. An account in 1712 12 of Jeffrey's discovery locates it at the sign of the Red Cow in Anchor and Hope Alley near King Edward's Stairs, and that's more or less the location of Wapping Station today, some distance from where the town of Ramsgate is. Moving further into the 1700s, it may just be a coincidence, but there was a ship lying here at Wapping Old Stairs called the Ramsgate, which was being offered for sale by candle in 1759. The pub website says that it adopted the name Ramsgate, originally Ramsgate Old Town, in 1766. The name apparently comes from the fact that fishermen from Ramsgate would land their catches here to avoid having to pay the taxes at Billingsgate Market. I couldn't find any written records of the pub name prior to 1813, the usual Sun Fire Office insurance records. The earliest newspaper mentions are from the 1830s, including a spate of robberies in 1831 and reports of flooding in 1834. Although it's hard to find a lot of written records of the pub, pub, particularly prior to the 19th century, much has been written about whopping old stairs. There is a mention of a sweet plaintive ballad in 1804, and I think this is the cover for the sheet music for it. 
Interestingly, you can see here a pub sign in the background, but I think it's for something or other Nelson. In 1894, a comic opera about whopping old stairs was written and performed, although the reviews for it weren't very favourable. Finally, I found a nice old print published in Tatler in 1903 of whopping old stairs, which appears to show a cheery glow of the back window of the town of Ramsgate pub. I think it may be an independent pub today. The staff were very welcoming and friendly. And here's a look at the beer lineup. I, of course, went for Harvey's Sussex Best Bitter in particularly good form here, I thought. So well done to the town of Ramsgate. As an added nice touch, they had Harvey's beer towels complete with the We Won't Be Druv slogan. Pub number two, and of course, the most famous on today's itinerary, the prospect of Whitby. It is another listed building. Historic England note that the original building is said to be circa 1520. There is a little bit of scepticism about that. But the current frontage, at least as seen from the street, is early 19th century. What's interesting about these riverside pubs is that they effectively have two frontages. There is one to the street and one to the river. And I think possibly the nicer side of it is the one facing the river. Historic England do note the river elevation has a hooded balcony and needled balustrade. It is of course also notable for the hangman's noose that attests to the era when pirates were apparently hung here for their crimes. It is rather nice being able to get out onto the foreshore at low tide. I just made it in time. On the ground floor, the bar counter is pewter top. I don't know the exact age, but possibly going back to the Victorian era. It's supported by barrels, which is an unusual feature. Not just the structural barrels in the bar, but on my visit they were also lining up the actual functioning beer barrels beside there. I don't know if that was just a temporary arrangement. There is a stone floor that in some parts of the pub it purports to be 500 years old. I think elsewhere I've seen it cited as 400 years old. This is undoubtedly a bit of a tourist hotspot, but I really rather like the interior of the prospect of Whitby. I may be challenging my credentials as a pub interior purist. It's bedecked in places with nautical regalia. There is what looks like bits of a ship's rigging. There are what appear to be old ship's lanterns and of course a ship's wheel. There are model boats, porthole windows and so forth. Just a couple of brief notes from Historic England. They say that the interior is much altered but there is some 18th century dado panelling on the first floor and actually that first floor space I found on today's visit was particularly atmospheric and interesting perhaps helped by the fact that it was empty. That upstairs bar room has a sort of bay window at the bar back something in between a serving hatch and a drinks cabinet I'm not sure how old that is. Okay so let's get into the history of the prospect of Whitby. There is a suggestion that this pub was originally named the Pelican and that would be somewhat supported by the fact that it is adjoining to Pelican Stairs, the alleyway that runs alongside the pub down to the river. Walter Kennedy, the pirate, was born at Pelican Stairs in around 1695, and I believe he is actually pictured in one of the prints upstairs at the pub. There were a series of fires in the latter half of the 1700s in Wapping, 1761, then one in 1763, another in 1775, and yet another in 1792, and at least two of those were caused by the local biscuit bakers. Presumably they were baking ship's biscuits given the location. And at least one source suggests that sometime in the late 1700s, the pub was renamed and rebuilt following a fire. Most sources state that the reason the pub was named the Prospect of Whitby is that it was named after a ship which routinely moored at this location, probably on Pelican Stairs or just off there. I found a record from the Sun Fire Office Insurance Company of 1788 at this address, 57 Wapping Wall, for one Francis Ayrson, who was listed as the Vittler at that time. There is also, a couple of decades earlier, an entry in the marriage registry at St Paul's Shadwell, which 
which is the closest church for one Francis Ayrson, and he hails from nowhere else but Whitby. I haven't seen this reported anywhere else, so you're hearing it here first. Doesn't necessarily mean that the original derivation that it comes from the name of a ship isn't also true. Perhaps Francis Ayrson was a member of the crew of that ship, possibly even its captain, and decided to retire, marry a local girl, and settle down here. For a while in the early 1800s, the pub was just referred to as the Whitby Town. The earliest newspaper mention I could find of it with that name is in 1844, and the earliest newspaper mention I could find of it named as the Prospect of Whitby is in 1861. The pub features once again in that wonderful article from 1890 in the Art Journal. I've seen various sources mention that at some point in the pub's history it was called the Devil's Tavern. I couldn't find any old written references of this, and in fact, the furthest they go back is to about 1950. Can't help but wonder if it might have been some sort of marketing exercise at that point in history. And there is at least one article that notes that some refurbishments were going to be made ahead of the Festival of Britain. It's a Green King pub today. Uh, I have to admit, I was quite impressed with the lineup on the bar, though, a little bit different from your usual Green King offering. There was, of course, Green King IP there and the house bitter which is always the same in every Green King pub that 3.9% ABV best bitter. I went for Guardsman which I thought was pretty good from the Windsor and Eaton Brewery. Pub number three Turner's Old Star. It's still in Wapping here but set some way back from the river. This is a very handsome backstreet boozer, a corner pub made of London brick. The ground floor Frontage is stucco fronted, has some Doric pilasters at the corners. There's also three Taylor Walker lamps suspended at the first floor. The windows, the upper panes are etched, possibly more modern, and the lower panes are stained glass. Inside you are greeted with a handsome and rather hefty looking bar counter. It has panels interspersed with these fluted sort of pillars or corbels I suppose and then a frieze with a kind of floral motif running along it. Columns above the bar counter support the gantry which has some etched glass panels in it. The owners of the pub very kindly offered for me to go behind the bar so I could get a closer look at the bar back fittings. Again very handsome quite imposing bits of woodwork here. I would say these look late Victorian the landlord thought possibly they're a little bit more modern than that, maybe Edwardian, sort of 100 years old or so. There's some very nice carving in those and some signs reading things like quality English ales, ports and sherries. Interestingly, a collection of garden gnomes and other possibly dolls and things on the top of those barback units. It's really quite a treat to be allowed behind the bar. That doesn't happen very often, so I was really enjoying this. Gives you a, a unique, different perspective on the rest of the pub. There's some lovely light that comes into the pub thanks to those stained glass windows. There is matchboard panelling on the ceilings and at dado height around some of the walls inside with a pool table over in one corner. The name of the pub comes from a reported association with J.M.W. Turner, the painter. According to the pub sign outside, he met Sophia Booth in 1833, and she was his mistress for the remainder of his life. He inherited two cottages on this site, converted them into a pub, and installed Sophia as proprietor. This is slightly at odds with the British Library's account of their relationship. It makes no mention of whopping, and instead notes that they live together in Chelsea. However, it's not impossible that both could be true, that perhaps they lived together for a time here in Wapping before later moving to Chelsea. Some of the details perhaps are slightly questionable that it was converted from two cottages by Turner himself. The pub is known to have existed back as far as 1775. There are licensing records at the London Metropolitan Archive to attest to that. That is the year of Turner's birth. It's very unlikely he was doing pub conversions as an infant. The earliest mention I could find for the pub in newspapers dates to 1800, at which time the pub was simply called The Star, and the address is Meeting House Alley. One interesting aspect of Turner's Old Star is that it's the local of the yeoman warders of the Tower of London, sometimes colloquially known as the Beefeaters. 
One of them retired recently, and by special permission, they donated their uniform to the pub, and it's now hanging on the wall in one corner. I really liked Turner's Old Star, and if perhaps some of the other Riverside pubs in Wapping are a little bit touristy at times, this very much feels like a proper locals pub. The owners, the staff were absolutely delightful, very much an independent pub, very much a family-run pub. I believe the current owners have been running it for 20 years, and it was in the broader family family for another 20 years before that. The lineup on the hand pumps looked to me to be representing two, I think, local small breweries in London. I went for the Porter from Broccoli Brewery. That was very nice. The other two, perhaps not my sort of thing, but I'm sure somebody would be more into those pale ales from Forest Road Brewery, is it? Pub number four, the Queen's Head. We're over in Limehouse now, and this is another Backstreet Boozer, another corner pub not far from Limehouse Station. This is a listed building, and Historic England note that it is either late 18th century or early 19th century. I would probably be inclined more towards the latter if you take a look at Horwood's map of 1799 covering the area then it looks like it wasn't actually laid out the street that it's on now known as Flamborough Street wasn't yet developed at that time so I think it must be more into the 1800s when this was built it does look Georgian although of course that timing would make it more late Georgian inside the pub still retains two quite distinct spaces a public bar and a saloon bar looking at the public bar first. This space is of course dominated by the bar counter. I struggled a bit to pin down a date on this. I think we're definitely well into the 20th century. I'm inclined to say possibly 1940s but if anyone has any thoughts on where they think this design dates to then let me know in the comments. The gantry up above has some coloured glazing and there are these nice lamps suspended on brackets from the gantry with more coloured glazing in them. They of course could be a much more modern addition. Over to the right of the bar counter is a three-bay mirror arrangement that looks to me a little bit like it may have at one time been a barback fitting, but I don't think it's any older than mid-20th century. In between the two bar areas, there is this sort of gallery space, and then beyond that, there is this saloon bar space, which, as I say, is a very distinct area of the pub. I think it has its own bar counter, but it was covered by a curtain on my visit. This area certainly had been laid out by the time of the 1828 Greenwood map, you can see the road marked. It was at that time known as York Street East, now Flamborough Street. The first newspaper mention also comes from 1828, and I wonder if this and the surrounding buildings were relatively newly built at that point as they were being offered up for sale. More recently, the pub's most famous association is a visit from the Queen Mother in 1987. Famously, she was offered champagne after pulling a pint and said, never mind the champagne, this is much better. Instead went for a pint of beer. You can still see the specific hand pump that she used on the bar. It's the one on the right there, I believe. And much of the modern decor of the pub, fittingly for a pub called the Queen's Head, is concerned with the Queen and the Queen Mother. Lots of pictures of various forms of the late Queen Elizabeth. I think it has been through a few changes of owners in recent years, so possibly some slightly difficult times, but I believe currently it's owned by a group of locals. The lady behind the bar was very chatty and clearly very proud of the pub and the way it was going. And uh, although it was, of course, very quiet on my visit, I pretty much had the place to myself. I've got the sense of another great community pub. They don't currently have any functioning hand pumps on the bar. No real ale served here, unfortunately, but I went for a half of Guinness, which was perfectly pleasant. Pub number five, the grapes. This is a very narrow frontage, which is appropriate as it's on narrow street. The building is possibly late 18th century. It is a listed building and historic England say that the current facade is likely 19th century. It has a very slender bay window nestled between two doors. Only one of those is actually functional today. Up to dado height on that slender bay window, there are green brick tiles. There is etched glass in the windows, although it looks much more modern to me. Like the town of Ramsgate and the prospect of Whitby, this also has a frontage, or should we call it a backage, I don't know, onto the river. I don't think there's any access to the foreshore here, though it's a sort of balcony overlooking the river. This is listed on Camera's pub heritage site, and they note that the front room would probably originally have been accessed from that now defunct left-hand door. I think the most prized spot in this pub is that little bench seating area in the bay window, 
and I managed to snag that during my visit, which I was very pleased with. It's a very woody sort of interior. It has a bare wood floor and wood panelling on the walls, wood panelling on the ceilings. I really appreciate how much of it has just been left unpainted. In cameras listing for the interior, they think that the counter is possibly into war, but the bar back may be much older. In particular, the middle section seems to be the oldest, the left hand part also looking relatively old and the right hand part perhaps a bit more modern. Of course we can't ignore that rather eye-catching feature behind the bar which is Gandalf's staff. This pub is partly owned by Sir Ian McKellen. There is this other artifact towards the back of the pub, a statue of Gandalf. There is also quite a nice upstairs room which has a few eclectic knickknacks in it including this rather attractive, is this Shinwazerie Bureau or is it Japan or some sort of East Asian bureau slash writing desk in one corner and there is an upper balcony from that room. I think that was closed on this particular visit but that gives another view of the Thames. I really love the balcony at the back of the pub here from the ground floor. It was high tide on my visit more or less and the water was lapping at the beams of the balcony. You can get a view out towards Canary Wharf from here and in the middle distance there is a statue by Anthony Gormley. I didn't dig too deeply into the history of the grapes. I think the pub claims on a sign outside that it has some roots going back to the 16th century. The earliest directory listing I found for this pub was from 1843. I just found that sort of amusing because of the way that it was jostled in between a tooth fumigator and an improved corset maker. I also found a nice mention of it from the Illustrated London News in 1887. So that comes with a drawing of of the back of the pub. The pub also lays claim to being the model for the Six Jolly Fellowship Porters pub as depicted in Charles Dickens final novel Our Mutual Friend. This is somewhat debated. At least one account I found from the 1870s which would have been not that long after Charles Dickens had died seemed to be quite convinced that the model for the Six Porters was in fact a pub called the Two Brewers just a few doors down from where the grapes stands today. There's no real remnant of it alas but you can still just about see the building that was actually pictured also in the art journal article of 1890 and you can see both this pub the two brewers and the grapes marked on the 1890s ordnance survey map ultimately of course that debate is a little bit futile because the six jolly fellowship porters is a fictional pub and it may well be that charles dickens created an amalgam of several pubs he knew along the river here at limehouse the pub that we find today is a rather beautiful one in my opinion it's quiet there's no music playing it has this lovely woody unspoilt interior also worth noting is quite unusually that no children are allowed at all at any time i know for some of you that may well be a positive selling point it's very much an independent pub today as i say owned by sir ian mckellen i think there are two other owners involved in the business there were a total of five hand pumps on the bar i think four of them in service on this occasion they had black sheep i think that has been a long-running fixture there i vaguely remember seeing that sort of 15 years ago and also timothy taylor's landlord that's what i went for on this particular occasion okay well we started the video on the foreshore seems fitting somehow to end the video on the foreshore more or less i'm on the back deck of the grapes thank you very much for watching see you on the next one bye bye